Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Hey guys, what's up? It's Darren here and welcome again to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Last month we had the most downloads ever in the history of the show. Uh, So I want to thank you all for supporting the show and for listening to us. Uh, This week we had J.D. Clark from the Ivy MBA program on the show. Uh, Ivy was ranked uh, number one by Bloomberg Business Week for international MBA programs outside the U.S., so it's a very uh, highly regarded program, and we had a really, really good chat. I think a few things definitely differentiate the program. One is its case study focus. You know, students are expected to complete over 300 case studies during the one-year program that starts in March, as well as the career focus uh, that Ivy has Uh, for its students. For example, did you know that only staff from the career management office of of Ivy interview MBA applicants because they really want to make sure uh, that the school can can help applicants, you know, find the jobs they're looking for. So I think you'll get a lot out of our discussion. And JD is is a veteran uh, in terms of business schools in Canada, and he shares a lot of great tips Um, not just for getting into Ivy, but for getting into any top school. So uh, definitely take notes on this one. Here at Touch MBA, we specialize in school selection. We know that there's lots of different programs out there, and it's hard to tell them apart and figure out which one, frankly, fits you best and that you'll be competitive at. So if you need help there, uh, go head over to touchmba.com. We'd be glad to help you out for free. Uh, you're going to need to upload your profile and tell us a bit more about what you're looking to do, what your career goals are, and uh, we'll do our best to help you out there. You can also share your profile with now over 10 top business schools from around the world for pre-assessments. If you want to get some feedback on your candidacy before you apply, you can also do that at touchmba.com. All right, let's get straight to the episode. John Derek Clark, or JD, is the MBA Executive Director of Master's Programs, Recruitment, and Admissions at the Ivy Business School at Western University. Um, You know, Ivy is a a top-ranked program in Canada. They're very well known for their case study methodology. And um, I just can't wait to learn more about what makes this program different and what makes it stand out. So thank you, JD, for your time, and thank you for joining the show. Glad to be with everyone. So always happy to talk about the MBA and particularly around uh, helping people make a decision about which MBA program is best for them. So thank you so much for uh, having me as a guest. JD, I know that you have a wealth of experience working for top business schools in Canada. Could you just give us a quick introduction um, in terms of uh, your background, your working experience? Sure. So I've been involved in working uh, in higher education for over 20 years now. I uh, worked at Queen School of Business, uh, another uh, top uh, business school here in Canada. The beginning of my career for about 10 years, I spent a couple of years working in Europe. And then I was at Ivy, worked at Ivy primarily when I came to Ivy first in our executive MBA program. Left for a while to work in the accounting profession, particularly around the education of certified accountants, and now have come back to Ivy in my role. And my role really encompasses across our master's programs, our MSc, our executive MBA program, as well as our full-time MBA program. So I have a real passion throughout my career, uh, particularly around helping individuals, you know, around their education choices and, you know, just that aspect of uh, investing in themselves. I also know you got your MBA from Ivy, correct, in 2010? I did. So I uh, did my uh, executive MBA while I was at Ivy as well, which was just a highlight of not only my educational experience, but professional experience as well. So it was a a great experience. So we're so lucky to have you on the show. I mean, decades of of experience working at top MBA programs, uh, business schools in Canada. So you have, I'm sure you have like a lot of interesting insights for our audience. First question I like to get to is, 
what makes the Ivy MBA unique? Well, I think I, I think I'm going to answer that in the way of what makes any MBA unique, and and I will say that, you know, my experience of looking across different programs is, you know, the curriculum. Uh, there are some changes on the edges and such, and. You know, when we get questions from candidates about how do I choose the MBA program that fits for them, is we go back to the question of how do you like to learn? And, and you know, it's about the culture in the classroom. And, and at Ivy, we're not a lecture-based environment. This is not an environment where the professor's at front and, you know, going over concepts and lecturing to the students. It's an environment where you're working on case studies, uh, real business situations, and you take on the role of the decision maker. And so it's not only about getting knowledge, it's about getting experience. And so the classroom environment is one that expects that the students in the classroom are engaged in the learning process. They're in there, they're discussing, they're debating, and they're interacting real business issues like they will uh, in the real world. And so the classroom environment is really something that somebody needs to look at and that makes Ivy unique is because... Uh, we have been using the case studies uh, methodology. Uh, it is, it's a way of learning that not only builds your knowledge, but also builds your experience as well. So, you know, I can speak about my own MBA experience. I don't remember the textbook chapters that I read, but I remember the cases. And, and uh, we have a class right now that, you know, is going through the program. And, you know, this is, uh, I went through the program about seven years ago. And I can remember the case studies that I did in the learning. And it, it's, uh, it's an incredible, uh, powerful way in the classroom. So really when people narrow down their choices of programs, just think about the classroom environment. How do you like to learn? And what type of environment will have the biggest impact on you? No, that's such a great point. And so could you, like, for example, take us into one of those classrooms, uh, at least with the full-time MBA program, because that's where most of our listeners are looking to apply to. You know, how many students are in the class? I mean, I would also be curious to hear from you, from your personally about how you feel like the case study really helps you today, you know, seven years later. Uh, the classroom environment, we have 70 students uh, in each section. So we have two sections, 140 students each. We have 70 students in a section, all from a, a broad range of backgrounds, which is important for the class discussion, bringing it into it. The professor before the class will assign a case study. He'll also sign background readings. So the background readings will be the theories and the concepts that are there. So the idea is, is that you review that material yourself. You get together in your learning team and review the material again. So in the smaller, intimate environment, you're going to say, here's what I got out of the case. What did you get out of the case? And then you get in the classroom environment and always starts around this discussion about what's going on in the organization. You know, what are the issues? And then what's really important about our environment is... You know, you may have an opinion about what's going on. You may have an opinion about solving the issue, but it's action-oriented. What are you going to do to implement your, your actions? And so when you talk to organizations today, they say all the time that we have smart people in our organization. We need smart people that can get things done. And so the professor's role at the front is to facilitate a discussion about a real business issue. There's no right or wrong answer. There's different opinions. But to also push the students on applying their learning, putting it into actionable steps, and also highlighting the key concepts and learnings and the frameworks uh, that are important in any uh, MBA program. So I'm going to share a personal story. In my career, I was involved in a very complex merger and acquisition. And uh, when we were going through this process, the consultants that we were working on the project with asked me the question about, you know, where had I worked? And, and brought the experience that I'm bringing to the table. And the truth is, I never worked in an environment where I did mergers and acquisitions. But I did in school. And so it was like I had been and had experienced that already because when I was in school, it wasn't just about here's the theories and concepts about a mergers and acquisition. Here is the systems that you have to bring together. Here are the cultures you have to bring together. And how would you do it? So I approached the situation just like I approach cases in schoolwork. And so I was bringing experience to the table, but I got the experience in working through the cases. Interesting. And yeah, I mean, I saw that Ivy students are expected to complete over 300 case studies in one year. That's correct. That's, wow. (laughs) That's a lot of case studies. You know, a great analogy I use all the time is it's like getting 15 years of work experience in a matter of a year. And you're working on 300 real business situations and issues, 300 situations where you have to be the decision maker. 
300 actionable plans when you were there. It doesn't matter. We can, you can talk to alumni that are two years out. You can talk to alumni that are 20 years out. They remember the case studies and they remember the discussions. That's uh, in, incredibly valuable. So again, you're getting the theories and the frameworks and the knowledge that's important in any program, but you're walking out with experience. And we hear that all the time when we talk to recruiters and, and people in industry about what separates Ivy grads as they say, they're ready to hit the ground running. Are there any new exciting uh, developments on the horizon for Ivy? Yeah, I think we're always looking at new exciting developments in, in a couple of ways. One is that we just launched this year an exchange program. So it allows our students the opportunity to uh, take the elective part of their programs with one of our exchange partners. We're always looking at innovative courses, especially in the electives. And how we decide on those courses is really working with the organizations that recruit our students and finding out, and that's really where you have to start with innovating anything you do, is talking to the people that recruit the talent from your organization, from your school, and making sure that we're meeting the needs of the market. So we're always looking at what electives we offer, what are we doing within the courses. We are the second largest producer of case study materials to Harvard University. And so, you know, the materials that the new cases that are constantly be, being developed are for our faculty uh, that are used in our classroom are always being innovated on, you know, real business issues and real business problems that are occurring in today's uh, world. Wow, I did not know that. Second largest producer of case studies. You know, academically, like what do students tell you in terms of which disciplines or which courses really stand out? I mean, could you highlight a few of them for us? Sure. I, there's a couple of things I, I, I think that stand out for students. And I, I think the first one is the leadership courses. And so when you're dealing with case studies, this is not about what makes a good leader and what makes a bad leader. It's about throwing you into situations where you have to make real leadership decisions. And I think that that is really important about developing leaders. You're dealing with complex issues. And it's not only about feeling comfortable with complexity, it's about embracing complexity, two very different things. The other thing that, that's unique about the case study methodology is it's unlike what we've done in our undergraduate studies where, you know, you take a course and then you don't see that course material as you go on. The case studies all build on each other. So... You know, you're getting constant practice with accounting principles because even if you're doing a, you know, the class today was doing a case in operations. And one of the things I had to do was look at the balance sheet of the organization and see how healthy it is. And so, you know, I could hand out a case. Our full-time MBA students are almost just over a third through their program. Now, if I hand them a case and say which class this is being taught in, they can't tell me because they're seeing strategy issues come out, leadership issues. They're seeing systems issues around IT. They're seeing internal operational issues. They're seeing strategic issues. Uh, they're looking at the balance sheet and looking at the accounting and finance aspect of it. And so, you know, the way that you can and what makes a great leader is you're bringing all the toolkits uh, to the table. Yeah, and actually that reminds me that your program starts in March, correct? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, so that is very unique. In fact, I think... You're the only program I've seen so far that starts in March. And the reason we start in March is to make sure that we have the core courses, so the foundation courses that every MBA program has. You can complete those by September for the on-campus recruitment schedule that happens in Canada. So a lot of the companies will come in, in on campus in September and start discussing you know, with the individuals in preparation for graduation. So that's why we start in March is to make sure that you know, again, the students are ready to hit on on-campus recruitment and have the necessary knowledge to be successful in it. It makes a lot of sense because I know the U.S. business schools, you know, once you get started, there's people coming on campus right away. So that makes that seems to make a lot of sense to me. And why should candidates get their MBA in London, Ontario? Yeah, so London, Ontario, it is around 360,000 people. It is a university town or university city. So the university is a huge part of the city. And, and what it allows and, and is, is a community feel. So, you know, all our students live very close to one another. They live to the campus. And so it's an immersive experience. We call it that it's not a commuter school. It's not a place where somebody would go to school and then commute maybe an hour to go home as they would in a larger city. And, you know, you might be very dispersed in a larger city where you live. 
And so I live in London, Ontario myself. It's not my hometown, but I consider it my hometown now. And so I've lived, you know, in Europe. I've lived in Toronto, in Kingston. This, to me, is a great city. It has everything you need. But, you know, what I love about it is being around the city and, and bumping into the students that are part of our program. And so it's that community feel, not only amongst the students, but also amongst the faculty and staff that are there. And so they build that, you know, the learning that happens in the classroom is there, but they're also learning outside the classroom and building uh, strong bonds and networking. Yeah, sadly, I have yet to visit Canada once, but I, I hope to make the trip out there soon. London, yeah, it sounds like a very nice, nice city. So if we could turn our attention to uh, admissions, could you tell us the fit qualities you're looking for from your MBA applicants? So we're looking, uh, you know, I, I think we look at a well-rounded individual. So there's not one thing that's more important in our admissions uh, than another. But we do start with looking, and, and, and what's really important for us is that we want to make sure that somebody will benefit from the experience. So we really look at their work experience, what they've done since they've been out of school, and the progression that they've had in their career. And really around, you know, what challenges have they experienced? What adversity have they experienced? And so we are a one-year program. We do not have an internship. And so what we want to do is make sure that, you know, the students coming into our program have the necessary experience that they don't need an internship being in our program. That they're coming in with the necessary experience that makes them very successful. And, and we make sure that people are, you know, have the experience. They also have maybe not a clear defined goals, but they've done a lot of research in their MBA as well. So they have a sense of what they're looking to get and what they're looking to get out of the uh, experience. But we want to make sure, because the case study environment is a discussion-based environment, that students have that necessary experiences and have some of those experiences that they can bring to the classroom. That's really interesting. One-year program, a lot of case study method, case-based discussions. And you mentioned that you're looking for candidates that have gone through challenges, that have been through adversity. Could you expound a little more on how they can demonstrate that in their application? Because I think a lot of applicants feel like they have to be Superman or Superwoman when they apply. You know, and here you're asking for, you know, maybe a time where you didn't succeed or you faced a, a really tough challenge. Yeah, I'm going to give two points. And I think this is not only unique to Ivy, but something that I, I counsel people looking at applications is the one is we're, we're all sort of set in talking about what we do rather than what we accomplished. So if somebody asks me what I do, I sometimes talk about what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, but tend not to talk about my accomplishments. So start getting into the mindset when they're thinking of applying to an MBA school and preparing for the interviews, where they stop talking about, you know, here's what I've done in work, but here's what I'm accomplished of. I think the other thing is that people need to do is think about that time when you felt on the pinnacle of yourself, right? You solved an issue. Or maybe it was a, an issue that you had with a coworker that you worked through, but something that you're particularly proud of. One of the best uh, interviews and one of the best essay questions I heard was actually some outside of work, where someone actually talked about their experience in taking over a peewee hockey team and coaching that team that was losing and had lost sort of that that fun out of the game and, and giving them the league championship. And to him, that was the most proud and the biggest leadership challenge, but outside of work. So also think outside of work. So three points. One is focus on your accomplishments. Start talking about the accomplishments. Second, start thinking about things that where you felt like the high point. And leading into that is thinking about things that may be outside of work. Love that. High point. Love that. Uh, I also saw that you guys do uh, recommend that applicants apply with at least a 600 GMAT score and a minimum B average. Yeah, so, you know, we look at the undergraduate grades and the GMAT score almost together. And we look at them to make sure that you have the intellectual capability of the program. So we say that you need a 600 GMAT score or above to be competitive. But if you have grades that are lower, and you can compensate for that by writing a higher GMAT. And one of the things that we think is important in our process, and again, I think in a point for, and as you know, being a admission, former admissions director as well, is it, it's counseling the students once they have their list of schools to engage with the admissions and recruitment staff early on, because we'll help guide you. 
And so one of the things will help is like, well, send us your transcript, take a look at it, and then we'll provide people advice on what GMAT score that they should aim for. But make sure that, you know, people that are out there that are thinking of applying for an MBA is really important that you engage with the admission staff and recruitment staff. We're here to help you and here to help you put together a strong application. I will be sure to link in the show notes to your resume um, assessment page, which I think is a great service that you guys provide. You know, applicants should really take advantage of the schools that are willing to counsel students, you know, before they apply. Because uh, a lot of the top schools don't provide that service. So I'll be sure to link to that in the show notes. And uh, could you walk us through the life of an application at Ivy? Yeah, so the first step that we encourage people to do is to have a discussion with us, to learn more about the program, how the program is structured. The next step is, if you're interested in applying, going the next step, is to send us your resume for what we call a preliminary assessment. And so what we do is we look at your experience, engage in a conversation with you, and let you know early on if your experience that you have fits with the profile of an applicant we're looking for. Um, Then our role in in recruitment and admissions is to work with you during the application uh, process. So putting together the components, any questions you have about the essays, any feedback that you're looking for, our goal is to help you put the strongest application forward. We do have application deadlines as markers there, but people are certainly uh, able to submit applications at any time that they want. We review them on an ongoing basis. So once your application is in, including the GMAT, uh, the admissions committee reviews it and you go to the interview stage. And the interview is very unique in that we involve the interviews done by our career management team. And this is more like a conversation than an interview. And so what we want to make sure is it's done with the individuals that work with our students in the program and helping our students, uh, you know, transition their career after their MBA. And so what we're looking for here is we want to make sure that we have a candid conversation, an open conversation about what you're hoping the MBA will do and what your career aspirations are afterwards. And so it is much about a fit for us, gauging that fit, as it's for you to gauge a fit with our program for the applicants and and what their career goals are. And then after the interview, your file is reviewed by the admissions committee. And generally, from the time you submit your application to hear back from us, including having the interview, is within a month time frame, from one month to six weeks. So usually we are able to get back to people within a couple of weeks after they've had the interview. And the interviews are done, you know, no need for people to come in person. We generally do them by Skype, just like the conversation that we're having today. And is that other interviewer in the room someone from the admissions team or student? No, it's actually the interview is done by our career management team. Oh, they're completely done by the career management team. Yep. Wow, that's very interesting. You know, we want to make sure at the end of the day, and our goal is is to make sure that people get in the program and the program fits with what their career goals are. And so that's really, really important to us. And the best way to do that is to have, you know, that opportunity to interview with the individuals that not only deal with the students, but deal with the individuals and the firms that hire from uh, our program. Wow, that's, that's so interesting. Yeah, at the university I used to work at, it would usually be one admissions person and one person from the Career Center. But I think that's great. This is the first school uh, I've ever had on the podcast that that has uh, only career management interviewers. So actually related to that, you talked earlier about someone who has done a lot of research on the MBAs they want to attend and has an idea of what they want to do afterwards. How specific, especially because, you know, they're going to be interviewed by these uh, career management staff, how specific do applicants need to be with their career goals? I mean, we hear about geography, function, industry. Right, trying to tr- trying to get a, a clear idea on those three dimensions. Could you share a bit more about that? Yeah, I think I want to acknowledge first that people may even have career goals, and as you would know in your experience, career goals going in that may change when they go through the program, and and that's important to recognize is that you know you may have a, a goal, and and they they may change by your choice in the program. That you know I was thinking about this industry, but now because part of an MBA is being exposed to different things. I mean, what I say to candidates is, and again, it's not unique to our program, but you want to go, it's just good career management to have, here's a plan A and here's a plan B. And so, you know, what you want to go in with a couple of options. It doesn't have to be zeroed down to say, I want this function in this industry. 
But, you know, to say, I want this function, maybe it depends which industry it is. Or I'm looking at this field, or is this industry. But it's also important to start thinking about plan B as well. And that just helps on your research when you get into a program is to research a couple of things that are there. So, you know, my recommendation to candidates looking at this is make sure you have a plan A and make sure you have a plan B. And it just keeps your options as you start to explore things. So say uh, some of your applicants, they're interested in getting into consulting. They'll likely be doing uh, those consulting type interviews when they're applying for jobs. Do your interviewers at Ivy, for example, have case, any sort of case studies type interview questions? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things, so there's the admissions interview, and then there's also prepping you for on-campus recruitment. And so what we do is in our admissions process, again, if somebody says they've uh, said that their interest is in consulting, we will have the career management professional that works in our career management department that works with the consulting firms interviewing the individual. So they are very familiar with what the firms are looking for and what backgrounds they're looking for. And they'll be very candid with candidates to say, you know what, you, you may have a challenge in this regard, or you may want to make sure you have a plan B coming in because you don't fit the profile even with an MBA added on that a, that a, consultant, a consultancy firm may look at. So again, it's really about having that discussion about does the program fit with what I'm looking for as, as well as a candidate. And so we want to, you know, part of this interview process is to get to know you more and what your goals are, and things outside of the application about what you bring to the table. But it's also an opportunity for the candidates to say, you know, here's where I want to go in the career goals. What will you help me to do to get there? Do you have any other tips for our listeners on how they can improve their chances? Yeah, I would say, you know, I think my number one tip that I've mentioned already is engage with the admission staff. I mean, we're here to help you and to guide you. I think that's important. I think it's also important when you narrow down your schools is to really do research. You know, talk to alumni from that school. You know, come and visit the school if you want to. Uh, We have a travel bursary program that allows people to come and visit our school, sit in an actual classroom. That helps in your admissions as well because one of the things you're looking for is what research have you done at our school? And other schools do this too. What, As you would know, Darren, in, in your experience, why are you looking at our school? and making sure that you've done your homework on it. The last thing I will do is just talk about, you know, one other tip that's more of a practical tip, but it's around uh, your essay question. The essay questions is to help set up the interview on what you want to talk about, something that's unique. So sometimes people will try to cram everything into an essay, but you'll have a lot of opportunity in the interview to kind of expand. Treat the interview incredibly important. So prepare for it just like you would a job interview. If you're on Skype, make sure you're dressed up for it. Like all of those things are incredibly important. Be on time, uh, be prepared for the interview, come with some questions to ask. Uh, That's really important as well. I think that's so true that the essay is almost like your headline and the interview is like the copy for those marketing folks out there. Exactly. So, yeah, I also talk about it. It's the same, it's the same thing. I say the, the essay questions is like your movie trailer. <laughs> yeah. Your interview is the movie. I mean, we're saying the same thing. It's, it's the same analogy. Right. And then, but I mean, that's the point is that, you know, a good trailer doesn't, won't have so many different things in it that it's hard to grasp, right? Exactly. You get a good idea of what the movie is going to be about from, from that uh, preview. So that's great. Great metaphor there. You know, would you advise candidates to apply earlier? Uh, rather than later, or is it, you know, admissions pretty much the same throughout uh, April through January? Admissions are pretty much the same. Where it gets a little bit, so we have an admissions deadline in November. Our last one is January for the March intake. For international students that require a student visa, January can be too late, you know, to get the paperwork necessary for the visa. So we say to international students, make sure that you get the application in November. You know, for some individuals, too, is if they have to rewrite the GMAT is to make sure they build enough time in if if they need to do that. And sometimes it's more mental that you get that idea that, well, I can rewrite it. If I don't do well, it's a lot more pressure to go in and write it and know you have that one crack at it. But for us, you know, especially around scholarships and everything else, we look at pretty much the rounds on a very equal basis. The only danger is someone near the end. It's international is getting the necessary uh, student visa paperwork in order. 
Well, that's a perfect segue to our next uh, section, which is about scholarships and financing. Could you let us know what percentage of your class gets scholarships and you know what average scholarship amounts are at Ivy? Yeah, so about 60% of our class uh, in coming to the program will get a scholarship. The average scholarship is $20,000 Canadian. So that just gives a, a sense of it. And those scholarships are awarded based on merit, right? Or are they also awarded on need? Absolutely, they're based on merit. We have a range uh, within that merit that will take into consideration uh, some need. The scholarships, the applicants, when they're filling it out, the scholarships are actually reviewed at the same time as the admissions committee. So when they hear back about Whether they get in the program or not, they are also informed about the scholarships. The best thing to do, I think, you know, how people can improve sort of their chances of winning a scholarship or doing it, make sure you talk to the admissions advisors and the recruitment advisors of things that you should highlight specifically around your work experience. Writing a strong GMAT improves your chances around it. Um, But we also have a separate uh, form on the scholarship, and it's important that people take that just as serious as the application in filling that out. Thank you for those very clear tips, because <laughs> I think that lots of times there's a, a lot of confusion surrounding you know, scholarships and whether people have chances. And I think that for all you listening, planning to apply to Ivy, talk to them. I mean, that point is loud and clear from what JD is saying. Get in touch with their office as soon as possible and, and see what you can do to maximize your chances. So could you share any other financing tips with our listeners? Yeah, so there's a a couple of things. We have somebody in our office who's a financial aid officer who will actually walk you through the financing aspect of it. Financing for domestic students, we have uh, line of credits. And we also have line of credits available for international students as well. It's sort of a combination between what savings you have, scholarships, and then also, you know, your access to capital or loan programs to access that. So We spend a lot of time, especially with international students, because domestic students, they have credit history within Canada. It tends to be a lot easier for them to have access to to student loans. And so we spend a lot of time with our international students, and we have lots of ways that we can point them uh, in the direction. We have very high placement rates after graduation. Our placement rate's at 92%, so people that are employed three months after graduation. So... That also fits into the financing that's available. So we have very attractive financing uh, packages available. So it's just, you know, again, back to that theme of engaging with us because it depends on the situation somebody's in, the country that they're coming from, the interest rates that are charged in their country. You know, we help guide them in any way that we can. You know, I can't wait to talk more about careers at Ivy because I know... And it's, it's been obvious to me during our conversation, but as well as on your website, that careers is a huge focus uh, of your program. And you had some very powerful statistics on your website. You know, your great placement rate within three months, as you said, over 90%. Highest starting salaries compared to other Canadian MBA programs for, what, over a decade? And I also saw this, which is what I want to ask you about. Largest and most qualified career management departments in North America. One of the largest and most qualified career management departments. Could you explain what you mean by that and how that benefits a student at Ivy? Yeah, we're really proud of our career management. And, and uh, you know, they're, we, we work very closely with them in, in admissions and recruitment. And they are all professionals in, in what they do. They come from a background where you know, either they've been coaching or working in industry in a hiring or HR capacity. Um, and I think I, I'm going to answer that in a way that, that you know, one of, one of the cultural things that I think especially about Ivy is that we care. We care about the students and we care about their success. And so the commitment that we have around the students and, uh, you know, in helping them. And, you know, knowing that not everyone comes from the same background and not everyone comes, you know, maybe some are skilled, very skilled in interviews and some aren't. And so, you know, what makes it special, what we do is that our goal is to get everyone ready and to make everyone as successful. And sometimes that's spending more time with a student than another. Uh, But the goal is the same is to get that individual ready from a career perspective. And it's not only about getting people set up for their, their first, you know, their job after MBA, but it's also giving them the toolkits to manage their career moving forward. Back in, in June, we had a, a session for our current students. We had alumni that were seven years out, 
we had a panel about four or five of them. And to hear them talk about not only, you know, they've actually done career changes post-MBA and the options that were available for them. And it's not only about the schooling that they did, but it's also about that skill set, about how they manage their career, how they manage their reputation, how they manage their narrative, which is incredibly important. Could you talk a bit more about, you know, being an alumni yourself of that Ivy MBA network? I mean, how engaged are alumni? Is it easy to reach out to them? What, what is that like? It's one of those things that around the culture, around the alumni, when you graduate, it's about paying it forward. And so, you know, I've used alumni for my own personal networking I've used it to help friends. Um, and we say to our students, don't go and send an email to 20 of them because you'll get 20 people coming back to you. <laughs> and it'd be a hard thing to manage. Yeah. You know, pick two or three. You know, and, I, and, and we have this incredible tightness in, in, uh, at Ivy that, you know, everyone's gone through the case experience. It's a, it's a shared experience. And so, you know, it's not like you're cold calling and just starting with somebody right there. there and there's also a culture of giving back. If an alumni or a fellow alumni emails me or a student emails me, I know that the expectation is you get back, but it's also I may require something, and the expectation to me is that somebody gets right back to me. So it's, it's a culture of the school, and it's been a culture that's been around for a long time, is that we do what we can. You know, and, and it's fa- fascinating hearing stories of other alumni talk about how they've helped. It's fascinating to hear the students talk about the alumni uh, that have assisted them. You know, and, and I can share that I've had alumni help friends whose, whose sons or daughters were looking for their first job, uh, you know, and taking the time to meet them. It's been incredible, uh, and I could tell several stories around it. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely hear the, the authenticity of that, you know, in your answer. And I think that's such an important part of, of where you go to school, you know. Are those 20 p- people willing to respond? Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And then, I mean, have you seen any trends in student placement at, uh, with the MBA class? Yeah, I think the biggest trend, and, and, and you've seen it over the years, is that you have sort of two ways that people will get placed out of an MBA program. One is that, you know, there'll be jobs posted on campus, and there'll be, uh, you know, large firms that will come on campus and actually uh, recruit the students. But there's also a lot of students that want to get into small, medium enterprises or sometimes niche markets. So we, we don't have large media companies coming on campus. And so the ability, you know, the, the student placement is much more than getting you a good resume and cover letter and preparing you for the interview. It's about preparing you to be a good storyteller. It's about preparing you to be have a narrative. It's about preparing you to, you know, network, which is incredibly important. And so that ability to not only get the resume and cover letter together, but it's like, how are you going to talk about your narrative? How are you going to talk about your accomplishments? How are you going to tell stories when they give you a case question interview? And how are you going to network when you get out there? And so what you see a lot more of is you see a lot more people that are finding jobs through a networking opportunity, which, which is incredibly great for us with the alumni network that we have. Um, so students that want to kind of pick you know, a career that may be outside of finance and consulting or consumer packaged goods, but maybe into media or small medium enterprises or entrepreneurial ideas or or firms. What would you say to international students who, you know, they've never been to Canada before, but Ivy has a great reputation there. They want to study and perhaps live in Canada. Is it very difficult for them to find employment? I mean, frankly, you know, as an international student in Canada, in a country they've never lived before. Yeah, and I think, you know, we take very seriously the responsibility in working with international students and admitting international students in our program. And from the point of view is we want them to have the option to stay in Canada. And so many of them want that. And so our placement rate is uh, for our domestic students is 92%. Our placement rate for international students is 89%. And so very, very close to where the domestic, you know, market is. And so, you know, the biggest thing that we do, the biggest thing that we do with international students that, you know, different maybe than a domestic student is international students are coming to Canada without the network that a domestic student may have. So domestic students will have a network from where they went to school. They'll also have a network of uh, where they were employed. And so one of the things we do with our international students is get them tapped into the Ivy network. 
teach them about networking, get them involved within the school, you know, their classmates that are domestic students to get introduced within their networks. But we take very seriously the responsibility to make sure that international students have the opportunity to uh, stay and work in Canada if, they, uh, if they'd like. One last question I have about your uh, career placements is I noticed you have very strong placements in, in the finance industry as well as consulting. And so I was wondering why so many recruiters come to Ivy uh, from the financial services industry. Yeah, and I think I'm going to talk about both of them because I think they come to Ivy because, you know, and this is important, I, I encourage people that are out looking at programs is ask them to send you the list of the companies that come year over year to recruit from your school. And, and the reason is that says a lot about the quality of the students that are there. Because if you're getting, you know, well-recognized firms that come into campus to recruit, that means that those firms are very happy with the talent that they're recruiting. And so what we hear from recruiters, and, and you know, we, we spend a lot of time surveying them because what's really important is that we're meeting their talent needs. That's incredibly important. And that loops right into the admissions process. And so, you know, for us, it, it's talking to the recruiters, getting their feedback, and, and we want to make sure that they come year over year and they're happy with the talent of the school. And so, you know, we take very seriously getting great quality participants into the program, giving them a great experience, making them even top quality coming out. Yeah, well, over the past uh, 40 minutes or so, we've learned a lot about Ivy. Um, I know I certainly have. And my final question is, is, is there anything else about the Ivy MBA that you just wish more candidates knew about when your team is, you know, a good, traveling around the world and, and talking to candidates? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think it's always one of those things that we, you know, it's about our case study method approach and, uh, and about, you know, I think a couple of things. I'm going to touch on one of the things is that we really care. And we care about doing the right thing, and we care about helping candidates and making sure that there's a good fit where they want to go with what the program delivers. And that's part of the reason why our placement rates are so high is making sure that, you know, we're meeting people's expectations. And that's really, really important. Our goal, and I know I've said it several times through this, is to help people in the process. And so, you know, make sure you engage with us, reach out, and, and make sure that you do it. And the other thing is we have a great learning methodology here that this is a, a program that's not only about developing the frameworks and the knowledge that you're going to take, but it's also about giving you that experience that's necessary as well. Thank you, JD, for your time. It was a great talk. And uh, yeah, thanks again for being on the show. Yeah, thanks so much, Darren. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up. And we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch MBA. See you soon.